welcome everyone. Um, in, thank you very much. Um, in this session, I'm going to talk about how SecureDB works together with Spark to build a data lake, operational data lake, uh, in the large scale for Chinese enterprise. Uh, my name is Yang Pan. I'm the VP of Solutions for SecureDB. So what is SecureDB and who you are? And usually not many people know SecureDB. SecureDB is a distributed database vendor in China. Uh, it's the only uh, distributed database built in China, actually. It's a top vendor in China for now. It has the uh, enterprise customers more than combined from MongoDB and Couchbase in China. And we received some recognition from the Global 100 um, Award, and also we recognize that the one of the 50 most innovative companies in China by Fast Company. So what we do? Okay, SecureDB is one of the 14 distributors globally in, uh, for Spark, and it can be used as a data source for Spark. And in 2017, uh, 2016, there's a landscape, a big data landscape. SecureDB is the only product listed in that built in China, so we are pretty proud of that. Uh, SecureDB has two product lines. The first one we call SecureDB. It's a new, general, uh, gener new generation of distributed multimodal database. Um, it's based on the NoSQL. It's very similar to MongoDB, but it has this SQL capability. You can use API, and also you can use the PostgreSQL to, to work on it at the same time. And also, we have an object storage engine to support the content management. So you can store distributed object files as well. So these two product lines work together. We cover from structured data to unstructured data. And it's kind of, we call it full coverage of a data model. So we support SQL, NoSQL, and object file processing. OK, now we work about the uh, operational data lake. Before we start, then we look at some data facts. Uh, this is one of uh, the data facts from uh, one of our clients. It's one of the biggest clients. The clients have more than 700 million user accounts in total. Um, they have two petabytes data volume, and they have 10K RPS in peak time. And also the query in the peak time is over around 10 billion rows of data. And by the requirements, the response time has to be within 100 milliseconds. So that's why when we talk about operational data lake, it's operational, it has to be real time and support high concurrency. And also, because of data lake, you usually have the full scale of the history data storage. And also, it supports multi-model data management. Before we start with the data lake, we go into through a business case and a use case to understand what we do. Here is a sample from a banking system. Um, the requirement is pretty simple. What they want is they want to centralize the data lake to coming from 40 or more than 40 core systems, like credit card system, banking system, uh, et cetera. And from the, from the centralized data, data lake, it supports all the other queries to support the legal or fraud detection investigation and some query platform. And also, instead of the online queries, they also need to support ad hoc query as well. So the requirements are simple. The initial idea is pretty straightforward. So what we do, OK, we synchronize from the data from all different core systems into a data lake. Um, the data could be synchronized based on the database logs. It could be synchronized based on the NAS files. It could be synchronized based on streaming process system, right? It can be all different kind of ways to, to put into the data, a data lake. And again, because SDB supports the API mode, supports sparse SQL and PostgreSQL, uh, you can simply use any SQL, any query ways you want to use uh, to get the data. So next, later on, we start to look at the data itself. In the banking system, they usually have legacy core systems. They have a new system. They also have different type of uh, data business data uh, in, at the same time. So when, when we look at that, we found out 
there's a lot of different type of schema of data they put into the same space. So what we need to do, for example here, let's say we have a three core system. We, we synchronize the data from core system from table uh, to table one to table three. And also some of the data need to be reconstructed and be modified. So we modify them, use the by spot SQL, and put into the table four. So we, all of them together, we call it a main repository. It sounds very simple in that way. But later on, we found it's a big challenge for that. There are lots of problems. So what problems do we have? The first one, because the data lake usually for the, for the, for the banking system, they usually replace the old tape. It's like archiving data, archiving data. So because we have all of the repository data, we don't want to we want to minimize the I.O., not to, use, not to corrupt the data, the disk, all the time. And also, it's not a good idea to read the direct data to the main repository all the time. And it's lack, of, it's a lack of isolation for the source of data management. And also, of course, they have a scaling issue. All the data are put together without any management. And they don't have the unified management tools for data, system source, and query. And also, it lacks of the standard interface for external system. And the performed issue, of course, come out in the in above of the reasons. So what's the solution we need, to go, we need to go to? First, we need to manage the query data and the computing source in the isolated area. We don't want to touch the main repository directly. And the data are cleaned and reconstructed in the cache region based on the query request, which means we need to build a sandbox, something like a sandbox, to have all the cache data region for all the data to, to support the query requests. And again, and all the data can be replayed or reconstructed any time you want. So if you don't like the, the binary request that's changed, you can reconstruct the data all the time. Uh, it, because it doesn't affect the main repository. And then, that's the overall business architecture we have for now. So, so in the green bottom, we have the main repository. It's basically, we call it business raw data. It's coming from all different kind of data systems. And we introduce a data scheduling and processing area. In that area, we explain a little bit later. So what do you do? It will schedule and construct the two different services for the data area. The first data area, we have online query area. The second one, we call ad hoc query area. And also, we have a sandbox area. For the online query, because the business request and the business already defined, we know what's going on. We know what kind of data we need to be used. So it's pretty forward. We use SPARSQL, we use mainstream uh, streaming process to prepare the data and the reconstruct data into online uh, query area. Usually, because SQLDB itself it supports document data type, it's a JSON format. But once you go back to online query area, we usually reconstruct into a big table. Uh, even SQLDB supports big table uh, type, of, uh, type of formats. And ad hoc query is very different. Ad hoc query, because we don't know what kind of SQL the user can put in, we don't know where the data related, where the data coming from. So the ad hoc query has to support to dynamically to find where the data coming from from the distributed system, where the partition, where the, where the file is coming from, then dynamically relocate and copy to the cache region and, the re, and the start to do the query itself. Now we look at the sandbox. Why we need a sandbox? Because the ad hoc query, usually the user will type different, all, type, all kinds of a SQL uh, language into a ad hoc query. We have to know if the query is bad or faulty. We have to know it's a good one. So we have to test run. So in the sandbox, we usually maintain a week of the data. Uh, in the, not the, all of the data, we usually maintain a week of data. So when the user put in the query, we test run it and make sure the query is fine and it can be passed. So once the query is passed, it will send the execution command to the scheduler. The scheduler will explain the query and go to the distributed file system, the database system, to, reload, to locate where the data from, where the data files. 
So we'll simply copy the data into the cache region and to do the ad hoc query. The next slide will see the whole structure of the, of the architect. So the banking system, we have an e-banking system, we have core system, credit card system in the bottom. Uh, we have different ECM platform, and also in the middle, the operational data lake is in the middle to support all kinds of business requirements. Actually, the main repository can be in any type of data. So in, in, this, ca in this case, we use the main repository as a secure DB as well. But actually, the main repository could be HDFS, it could be Cassandra, no matter what type of data you want. Because Spark SQL has the connector can, can read and, 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 and reconstruct the data all the time, as long as it can provide this, uh, Spark SQL connectors. And online data, online query data, can also be in different operational database. Uh, it can be Oracle, it can be MySQL, it can be MongoDB, whatever you are familiar with. But in our case, in both sides, we use SQLDB. Okay? So now, now just uh, quickly go through uh, how we do the online uh, queries, uh, the query process. So, the first, the data import into the main repository uh, from the external system, and the data reconstruct based on the scheduler, and a scheduler called the Spark SQL to reload the data into the main uh, online query area. Then we transform from any type of schema data into a big table data. And then the user from the other side execute the queries, and the middleware query the data and then return the result. It's pretty straightforward. As again, the ad hoc is only differences. They has to replicate the data dynamically because they have to explain the query to find out where the data from. That's the only difference between ad hoc data uh, comparing to the online query data. Okay, now we go to the, the te technical details. So SecureDB has two things here. The first one is called SecureDB connector to support Spark SQL. So why do we use Spark? Uh, not anything else. Uh, Spark SQL is very useful for ETL tool. Most of the time, we replace the other ETL tools using Spark. And the user is very simply for any of the user developers they can use standard SQL to join data from multiple tables and put back into one big table. And Spark is able to connect any external data, and, and, and external data source, as long as the connector is provided. In this case, SecureDB, uh, the new release 2.81, uh, can work with Spark 2.0. And, and also, we support the language of JDK 7 Plus and Scala 2.11 uh, above. OK, so how we use the connector? The first, there are two methods, two ways to use it. The first way, we can simply use Spark SQL. We can create a table or view. Uh, we can specify the table view name and also can put on different options and to create a new table. And here, remember, we can, we can see there's a schema here. Um, usually, the schema by default is optional. You don't need to specify the schema. If you don't, uh, if you don't specify the schema, it will generate the schema based on the data. But in most of the case, we, set, we recommend to have the schema uh, set, up, set it up. So after you create a table, then you can simply insert the data into the, into the into the new table, and into the, where the table you have created. The second method is simply use the RDD. You can simply create RDD, and you can use the Spark config and create the Spark context. It's very simple. Then you create RDD, load the data based on RDD uh, methods, you can put it back to a new table. It's very simple. And Spark Connect architecture, uh, we support most of the, uh, all, pretty much all of the APIs, the Spark connector has, has to be support. We start from the relation, we have the RDD, we have the filter, partitioner, an RDD iterator, cursor, schema sampler, and the writer. On the right, the map is the whole structure of the account, uh, architect of the de API designed. Okay, so next slide, what about the uh, data type? Um, the SQL DB Connect data type is compatible to all the Spark SQL data, data type and the SQL data type. We just changed a little bit name. It's very straightforward. The first one we call int32, int64, stands for int and big int. 
And we introduced uh, three things. Uh, one is called object ID, because SQLDB by its default is NoSQL. It's, it's a JSON format. It's very similar to MongoDB, so we have an object ID to, for the row IDs. And also, in the, in the bottom, you can see the minimum keys and the maximum keys. They are usually to define the data range. Uh, for example, when we talk about how the ad hoc queries can find the locate the data, usually they, they can locate it by the range. OK, Spark Scheduler. So the, what does Scheduler do? Scheduler is a set of management tools and that's allow the data load to be automatically scheduled. It contains uh, uh, five components. We have a message processing. We have a metadata manager. We also have a partition manager, a task manager, and a RESTful APIs. So here's the sample. So for example, we have an ad hoc query. We said we want to find out the one month of the 2017 the data into a new table. So the query has to be explained and they have go to, uh, to relocate, to locate the data from the, from the file. They can simply copy the files from the main repository. The file actually is we call the collection space in our uh, secure DB. It's a collection space, it's a file format. We can simply secure copy the file into the new cache region. It can be loaded right away. And then in, in the 10 gig network, the copy is pretty fast. And usually in the cache region, you also maintain, uh, the, and you want to maintain to be removed all any no longer needed data, and it has to be removed. And then return the data from the cache region and then read from the repository, main repository. That's the, how it works for the automatic scheduled. The next slide is it's a data workflow. Uh, that's to explain what we just explained. Expand the data, go through all this process, and find out where the data are, and copy them back to the cache region. So here is a data scheduler highlights. So what's the, what's the first one? It's, it overrides the partitioner. So when the user starts to, start to uh, put in the query, they look at the partitioner from the scheduler instead of from the main repository and locate the related data loaded to the cache region. And also the scheduler service itself is a stateless. The perform a data copy test before returning the explain to the connector. It removes expired cache when it's no longer needed. It support the whole package itself supports the HA and the load balance. And also it makes the data safe, much more safe because we don't touch the main repository all the time. We can rerun we can reconstruct the data anytime you want. And also, in the other hand, if you have a different type of business requirements, you can build a different type of data lake operational cache region for the, for the operational data lake. Okay? So based on the project we have, for in, in this case, we have 40 different application systems. We call it core systems. And the OLTP features used to in order to make sure the data in the SQLDB is consistent with the product. And also in the online OLTP, uh, the financial industry using distributed database. And overall, we already have one, 100 or 107 physical nodes deployed for the banking for one of the clients. So that's uh, pretty much the uh, very simple and straightforward presentation I have today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yang. And now we have time for questions. Please raise your hand. Well, looks like no one. <laughs> oh, yeah. there we are. Uh, so have you ever considered about, for example, firstly you load the data to uh, Spark, and uh, you deal with the data, you generate a uh, results table for that. And you want to join the, that result table with the, another table that is in, uh, in your database. And uh, how do you optimize such join? Uh, could you repeat again? Just need to. So uh, you load the data from your data source. Yep. Uh, for example, table one. And uh, mm, you deal with that, the table one and generate the table two. And you want to join the table two with um, another table that is stored in the uh, data source, for example, the table three. Mm -hmm. 
so for your connector, is this one direction or two directions? Uh, it's one direction, I think. Oh, OK. OK. So you, uh, if you want to do that join, you need to uh, load the table three from the data source to Spark and then join in Spark. Right. Yeah, so uh, if I get it right, so what happened is in SecureDB, we have a partitioning we call um, partitioner. Uh, at the same time, we have the sharding capability uh, in, the, in the database. So what happens is when you talk about, when, the, when you prepare the cache region, so the data has to re relocate from uh, where the data coming, or where the data are, right, where the data is. So what happens is it look at the minimum key or the keys to make sure um, it's, it's in the right partition. So when the partition to, to understand where the collection space are, so the files, so we can locate the files and the copy the files into the cache region. That's the first part about the copy and the relocate the data. It's nothing to do with the Spark SQL yet, okay? So once we copy the data into the cache region, we, made, we already shrink the data size from the main repository. And then again, we use the Spark SQL to reconstruct the data from our different schemas into a big data table and put into the cache region at the same time. Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> well, unless there are any more questions, uh, let's thank again Yang for the presentation. Okay, thank you very much.